The story of Andrew and Erna Viterbi is a story of a long journey. Andrew Viterbi was born 69 years ago in the small northern Italian town of Bergamo. My father was an ophthalmologist and uh, it was a very comfortable uh, childhood uh, for about three years and then we found that we were no longer uh, wanted in Italy. Mid-1939 we were ready to leave and we left just in time in a sense. It was tough uh, and uh, my father was 58 years old and he had to essentially take all the medical boards over again. Uh, to my good fortune, he did it in uh, Boston rather than New York, and we moved there in uh, early 41. He went to MIT where he did his undergraduate studies, including a master's degree, and then he moved uh, to sunny California. By good luck and coincidence, I met uh, Erna, who was uh, <laughs> destined to become my wife. We met uh, through some uh, friends of ours and cousins of his. For a long time they wanted us to meet and finally they were able to achieve that and I guess they were right. <laughs> In mid-1957 I started working at JPL. Then three months later Sputnik got launched and suddenly the space race was on. It was very exciting. I met him as soon as he arrived at JPL. I told him the most important thing was to fill out a few papers to make sure he got on the payroll right away. Andy worked for Saul, I worked for, for Andy is the way we looked at it those times. And the work I was doing was very interesting. It was in spread spectrum communications. Spread spectrum is the idea that instead of putting all your energy at one frequency, you spread it out over a wide frequency band to make it much harder for an enemy jammer to jam your signal. Andy's contributions at JPL were numerous and of a wide variety. Andy advanced the technology that was already being used at JPL very significantly. As his career developed, his family grew. The kids were always around him. It, however, it didn't stop him from working. He put them on his lap and hold them and keep on working for hours. My relationship with uh, USC began in 1957. Andy was working at JPL full time, but he wanted to pursue his uh, studies and do a PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, on the other hand, I didn't have the means to go full time. USC was the only university that could admit him into the PhD program on a part-time basis. USC gave me that opportunity. USC was there for him at the time and it certainly has made a difference in his future. It was U.S.'s win and everybody else's loss. After I finished my degree, the uh, dean at the time, uh, Zorab Kaprilian, was trying to upgrade the faculty and uh, one of uh, the candidates that he asked me about was Saul. And I said, by all means, but I don't think you'll be able to recruit him. <laughs> and I was wrong. I've now been at USC for more than 41 years and certainly uh, Andy played a large part in making that happen at the beginning. Andy, however, went to work at UCLA. At UCLA, we were able to start a new program in communication engineering. And uh, uh, Andy was an absolutely uh, appropriate candidate at the time. It's difficult to explain the uh, idealism, the expectation that we were really going to do something great and glorious and I believe that um, with people like Andy here we made a significant difference. One of the main problems Andy was working on was the issue of interference in radio communication. With so many radio waves filling the air, signals can literally get lost in the noise. You have to have a way of retrieving information correctly from this, uh, from a corrupted version of what you transmitted. The solution came to him in the most unlikely of places. Our first two little children were in a Purim costume contest in a synagogue. I was trying to get my husband's attention to tell him that they won the contest. And he was very busy doodling, doodling, and it turns out it was the Viterbi algorithm. I came up with uh, some ideas which were kind of based on uh, a tennis uh, tournament, uh, eliminating losers, but always having new players come into the game. 
We knew it was an important piece of work, but of course we had no idea of how it was going to revolutionize communications altogether. This is the original copy of the Turby algorithm. I read the paper and I really didn't see the, the uh, importance of it, or the significance of it, I should say. Needless to say, I was certainly wrong. Viterbi's algorithm turned out to be a major step in making high-speed digital communications possible. The Viterbi algorithm provided a new and simple way to extract the proper signal from the noise. The filtering process makes it possible to transmit at a lower power, from longer distances, and with more users on the network. It is revolutionary. Satellite communication, cellular communication, quite a few other things that we now take for granted, it made them really feasible to use on a large scale. I can definitely say, with 45 years of experience and working in communications, that it's the most important thing I've seen. And it's relatively easy to teach. I taught a number of courses in the area of digital communications for undergraduate and graduate students. And yes, I was teaching the Viterbi algorithm. I teach the Viterbi algorithm in several classes here at USC, and I can even teach it to undergrads because it's such a simple algorithm in hindsight, and it makes such good intuitive sense. It's not just some theoretical concept that never really made it out of the academic community. Every cell phone in use today has at least one Viterbi processor in it, and sometimes more. But other things that you might not associate with communications, like the disk drive in your computer has a Viterbi uh, detector in it. Over the years, Andy continued to make his mark on engineering, garnering numerous awards and earning entrance into three national academies, including the National Academy of Engineering. But it was the desire to put his theories into practice that propelled Andy toward a pioneering career in telecommunications. We decided it might be uh, advantageous and quite interesting to pool our consulting and start a little company. And this was uh, what we did in 1968, it was called Linkabit. And in the mid-80s, after they sold uh, Linkabit, they started Qualcomm. And the rest is history. There's a large number of patents that Qualcomm applied for starting around 1988 and going on to the present day. I think they have well over a thousand. Qualcomm started with the notion that if you have very, very bright people and good ideas, you're going to find your way to success. And Andy's Viterbi algorithm was fundamental to almost everything we did there. And the very first product that we sold was a Viterbi decoder. He's truly a unique individual because he's one of the very few who excelled in academia and also in business, in industry. He always came home happy from work and uh, Every day he left happily for work, but he also came home happily. <laughs> Erna is a wonderful lady, and uh, she has been the rock of the Viterbi family. Uh, she was indeed a great force in his life. They're a wonderful, warm, caring family. Throughout it all, Andy and Erna never lost touch with USC. My relationship with USC uh, goes back uh, uh, almost half a century. He's been involved with the school. Uh, he has known all the deans of the school. And uh, he also said that he's been watching us very carefully. And I think Max has done a great job in, in the time that he's been uh, dean and uh, he's got great plans for the future. And that's one of the uh, strong incentives for us to name the school. Last November of uh, 2003, we announced our fundraising initiative uh, to raise $300 million for the engineering school. When I heard uh, Max uh, describe his plans, uh, I, I came back that evening and uh, discussed it with Erna and said, uh, maybe we should name the school. And she said, why not? I immediately endorsed his idea of giving it to USC because I felt that it had done great things for his career, his future. And so on March 2nd, 2004, the stage was set for the official naming of the School of Engineering. And in true Viterbi fashion, it was a family affair. The Trojan family included.
Now this donation from the Viterbi's is the largest naming gift ever received by an American engineering school. Today it's my great pleasure to announce that, thanks to their gift of $52 million, the USC School of Engineering will become the USC Andrew and Erna Viterbi School of Engineering. $52 million is a lot of money. This very large endowment gift will create wonderful opportunities to improve the quality of the students, the research, and everything else that goes on in our school. The bigger contribution and the bigger impact will be the name, the Turby School of Engineering. To have a school named after someone of that stature would be very, very important even without the money. What makes it so wonderful? and so memorable for me personally as the Dean is that nobody solicited Andrew and Erna Viterbi for the naming of our engineering school. It was their decision, they made up their minds and they acted very decisively. I am most proud to have our name associated with this world-renowned institution. One of his best students and his wife want to wish all of the students of this campus the very best. Someone mentioned Erna crying as part of the ceremony. I'm getting a little bit shook up here. It doesn't surprise me at all. She's just caring. Something like that really hits her very deeply. In addition to Dean Max Nikias, the Viterbis credit their continued support of USC to its president, Stephen Sample. Steve Sample has our immense, immense admiration. I think the legacy uh, of the Viterbis at USC will live on forever. By naming a school, uh, you know, you perpetuate your name into eternity, because universities are eternal. I'm very, very proud to know them. And so thanks to Andrew and Erna Viterbi, the future of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering has never been brighter. The journey of Andrew and Erna Viterbi embodies the American dream. The bonding within the Viterbi family has always been extremely strong. With this naming gift, they have opened up to embrace the entire Trojan family to become part of their own. We're very pleased and proud to give back to USC. Of course, the kids of the whole world are our family, and the Trojan kids are the ones whom we hope will bring great things to this country and this world. <laughs>